Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marshall Ballard. I'm here with Camp Creek Native Plants. I'm here to introduce my little brother, Andrew Ballard. He's going to speak to you today about Mississippi mushrooms. Uh, a lot of what we do focuses on the native plants and native ecology, perennials, wildflowers, uh, but also uh, fungi and, and mushrooms. And Andrew, uh, probably about, I don't know, 10 years ago, started, uh, I'm not say started, but really started uh, growing and developing and hunting down a lot of these mushrooms native to Mississippi, uh, growing them, uh, really getting into the science behind it all, how important uh, they are to our ecosystems and to our environment. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to stand in front of you and try to act like the expert. I'm more of the mouthpiece, uh, but I just wanted to introduce my little brother, and he's going to talk to you. We're going to go through some slides, look at some images, and he's got all kind of information to you about the importance uh, of our mushrooms that you can find throughout our great state. Uh, so without further ado, here's Andrew. Now, I've been I've been studying mushrooms, all self-taught. You know, I didn't go to school for any of this. I've been studying for close to 10 years, not quite 10 years. So everything that I've learned, I've picked up in the field. Or, you know, I'd go home and look at YouTube videos, Google. Um, there's apps on your phone, iNaturalist, those types of things. I would go out on walks, take photos, and really just, I was trying to figure out all of them. I wanted to know them all. And what got me started was one day at, we have some property in Tipton Tip County. One day my father and I were hiking through the hills. We do uh, ephemeral hikes where we're looking for the early, early spring plants that come up real quick, flower, and go back into the ground. We were looking for that, looking for those to collect seed. And I just happened to look down next to a tree and I saw a huge mushroom. And I didn't know what it was, but it was probably six inches tall. And I walked up to it and I pretty quickly could tell that, oh, this is a morel. But I had no idea, you know, I just knew what a morel mushroom looked like from the internet or stuff that I've seen on social media. And so I go home and dad and I take this mushroom into his kitchen and we prepare it and we eat it and it was one of the most delicious things I've ever eaten or found in nature. Um, and so that really kind of kick-started it off. I'm one of, the, one of those types where I like to know everything. I, I graduated from Mississippi State with a degree in biological sciences. So I'm very research, I love to do research, I love to do lab work. And so what I decided to do to learn as, most, as much as I could about these mushrooms was I decided I was gonna grow them to really kind of get a connection with them. Um, and in doing so, you learn everything about the, the mushroom that you're trying to grow, which was, which was my goal. Um, I've always been a nature lover. Uh, I was fortunate in New Albany to have a great Boy Scout troop, Troop 17, the Methodist Church. And we went on a camp out once a month. Um, and really, just kind of, at an early age, all I knew. We were going camp outs, my dad, we were going on hikes and walks. And that's how I got into mushrooms. I was intending on kind of going into some cultivation, but I would be up here for an hour and a half and it's really easy for me to kind of ramble and, and go on and on. And so I'm gonna skip that portion. We're just gonna talk about the mushrooms that you can find in Mississippi. Before I go into these slides, I wanted to kind of go over a few vocabulary words. Um, so this, is the fruiting body of the mushroom, akin to a flower on a plant. Um, so when you see a mushroom, this is what they call the fruiting body. The actual mushroom you never see. The mushroom is underground and uh, called mycelium. And mycelium, Mycelium is this white structure down here. You very rarely see it unless you're working in the garden, you move leaves, or you kind of stick a shovel on the ground, you'll see this white ropey structure here. That's the actual mushroom. This is what's doing the work of the decomposing. This is what feeds the plant. So if you were to take a cross section of uh, the root structure of a plant, there's more fungal cells in the roots of a plant than there are plant cells which is kind of crazy. Uh, so it's an integral part of nature. Without the mycelium, um, we would be drowning in leaves, um, dead wood, you know, the mushrooms are what break down and make the soil 
They break down the nutrients in the soil to make them uh, to make plants be able to uptake nutrients such as nitrogen. Without mushrooms, there would be no nitrogen. So it's very very important. Um, next, you have the cap, which this is a bad example to give vocabulary. That's a morel. They don't really have caps. Um, so this would be the cap of a mushroom. These are baby chanterelles. This would be a cap, and this is the stipe. And so if I'm referring to cap, I'm talking about the mushroom top, stipe being this, the stalk portion. And if you were to flip this mushroom around and look at the underneath side, you would see the gills. The gills are the sporing structures. A spore is akin to a seed for a plant. So the spores are the mushroom seeds. The spores will fall out of the gills, land on the ground, and then that's when the mycelium will start to grow. Once the mycelium's there and mature, you'll see the mushroom pop up. Um, just some really quick facts. Um, so under every footstep that you take, there's about 300 miles of mycelium, and this is well researched. Um, if you were to take this white rope that was in the previous picture and place it end to end, you would have about 300 miles, and that's under every footstep. So you're 300 miles, 600 miles, 900 miles, and it's astronomical, astronomical. Um, so the largest life form, the largest living organism on the planet is not a whale, it is a mushroom. Um, there's a mushroom in Oregon called a honey mushroom, and it's about, what is it? I think 500 kilometers, no, 1,500 miles, sorry. It's 1,500 miles wide. One single organism, that's one mushroom. The mycelium is 1,500 miles wide, and it's moving, currently it's moving towards the redwood forest in that area, and it will kill those redwoods really not much you can do to stop it. Um, we're talking a thousand years from now, the redwoods will probably be consumed by a honey mushroom fungus. Um, the, the mycelium structure is, uh, let me turn off that music. The mycelium structure is, uh, Mycelium structure is referred to as the wood wide web. And so what the mycelium does for plants is the mycelium grows towards plant roots and it'll wrap itself around the plant roots. Um, and what this does is it increases the, the drought tolerance of the plant. So the plant can uptake more water because the mushroom's there. Not only that, but the plant can take up more nitrogen any of the building blocks that plant needs to grow, it's going to get from the mushroom fruiting body. Um, not only do they send out nutrients, but they can also warn the plants of when an impending attack is about to occur. So if a mushroom, if the mycelium is being attacked by, say, a pest, that mushroom will send a signal to its, the tree roots that it's associated with, and that tree will begin to prepare for that for those pets whether that be send more sugars into the bark to, to increase the fungal um, properties of the tree really really interesting stuff um, even wildfires so mushrooms can sense or know when their mycelium is starting to get close to a wildfire and so they shunt all of their energy and nutrients away from that and they'll start to pop up mushrooms further away from the fire so they'll grow new mycelium away from the from the environmental damage that's occurring. So just is, I really encourage you if you haven't if you have don't know much about mushrooms to just go online and give it a quick 30 minute Google and your mind will be blown. I'm telling you they're they're crazy. I'm gonna get into some of these pictures here. Let me get all the way back. And then I'm just gonna go pretty quick here. This is the mushroom that everybody wants to know about. Um, everybody in April and May, mushroom foragers, this is what they're out looking for. This is a Morellus, uh, morel species. Um, I like this picture because you can see, you can see the mycelium here, and it's kind of rare to find 
this species of mushroom growing on a piece of wood like this, but go ahead. Is there a false morel? There are false morels, and I, I had a good picture of here on one. There's two different ones, and I've got a good picture of one. I lost my other one. Um, this is Thomas Beam, one of my good friends. We went out walking in a secret spot that I have. Uh, morel hunters are very secretive. You, they will not tell you where they're finding their mushrooms, and they have the good reason. They fetch, if they're selling them, close to $50 a pound. It's, it's like gold coming out of the woods. But, um, so come early April, or mid April into May, once the soil temps reach about 50 degrees, 50 to 60 degrees, and yes, you can go out with a thermometer and stick it in the ground, that's what I do. And when that, when that hits 50 degrees, that's when I know it's time to hit the woods. There's lots of different signs, you know, but that's the guarantee. If the soil temps are at 50 degrees, you're gonna, you know, that's the best chance you have at finding a real mushroom. Of course, if it's early spring, it's gonna be colder outside. So what, you gotta kinda of think about what areas of the woods will heat up first. So a south facing slope, you know, that's gonna get all the afternoon sun. It gets most of the sun all day from uh, the sun hitting the ground on a south facing slope. So it'll heat that ground up first. And so when I'm going morel hunting, I'm gonna to go to the south facing slopes first. And then maybe in a couple weeks, I'll go to the north facing slopes because that's when the north side of the hill will have warmed up to the right temp. There's several different species of morels. This is the um, yellow morel, so this is the one that probably fetches the highest price and it's the best tasting, in my opinion. Um, but there's different species. You see how this one's a little bit different. I think this is Brevet's, Morella Brevet's, but you see how it just abruptly stops right there at the captain. Also Morel, also edible. And I have a, quite a few. This year was a banner year for Morel mushrooms. Um, just hundreds and hundreds. However, for a lot of our other mushroom species, it was a poor year because during the summer we had some drought. You really need consistent rainfall if you're gonna find a good bit of mushrooms. But this would be one of the first ones in the year that you're going out looking for. Just go through these. Is that a hardwood tree? That, that they're gonna associate with, thank you for asking. They're gonna associate with ash trees and elm trees. So not only do you need to know how to identify the mushroom that you're looking for, you need to know how to identify the tree species that they're associated with. Morels or people say ash and elm, which is kind of tough. Elm trees around here, you know, have a disease. And so they don't get really large or sort of make it easy to identify it. So a lot of times you'll walk up on um, what you think is elm or ash. And really that's as good of direction I can give you on the elm trees. If it has the corky bark, if the, if the leaf on the elm has the, it's hard to explain, but the bottom part of the leaf will not be equal. One side is slanted in further than the other. That's where you wanna go. And you wanna go directly under that tree in the root zone of said tree. So under the canopy is where you're gonna to wanna to hunt. Um, I, however, have found them anywhere and everywhere. Um, one spot that I find a lot is in uh, privets, unfortunately. For some reason, they love privet. And so if you have a good privet ticket, it can be difficult to get in there and walk around, but for whatever reason, they love rivet. They love, uh, in my, uh, in my, in my property, I find it. Like a thousand dollars a pound, right? They're worth a ton of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
was an article in the Mother Earth uh, Journal News, I forget, well, magazine, right, yeah. back in the spring, February or something. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody here in the States is selling uh, spores. Yeah. Start your own, but it's like a three year process. Yeah, so it, it's not, and it wouldn't be. Long time to find out you don't have any. Yeah, and <laughs> it's one of those things that I'm big into mushroom. I grow mushrooms myself. I grow shiitake, I grow lion's mane, I grow reishi, I grow oyster. And that mushroom, for even, I've, and I've been doing it for six years, I honestly wouldn't even give that one a shot because the stuff that they're growing them in labs, you know, the, the very, very strict growing parameters, which I just don't have access to um, currently. But it would be nice, and they are, as of last year, they're starting to cultivate them, which will drive the price down for, maybe not for the wild forged ones. Um, Asia always has a huge market for anything wild forged. You know, they're going to pay more money for a wild morel than they would a cultivated morel. It's just their nature. Is it true that, um, like I've read where chefs only want mushrooms that are grown wild and in certain like in old caves or old tunnels or stuff, is that, can you really discern the difference in the taste? I wouldn't think so. Maybe you probably could between wild and cultivated, but I, you know, they're growing them in what looks like, uh, it doesn't, they're growing in facilities that almost look like a medical facility. <coughs> you know, they're extremely clean, well kept. Um, the, the risk of bacteria infections is very high, and so they have to clean and sterilize everything. I don't see it. I don't see there being much of a difference um, between those two. Maybe some flavor, maybe a little bit of texture, but you'd probably have to be like a, I don't know, mushroom snob to, to be able to point that out, and I'm not one. So, uh, next on the list are chanterelles. These are baby chanterelles. Let me go ahead and skip to it. This is a mature chanterelle, let me get out of the way. Um, these are probably one of the easiest mushrooms to identify in Mississippi, morel also being number one. And when I get to my false morel picture, I'll kind of show you what, what a lookalike looks like, and they don't look alike at all. Uh, this is your chanterelle, um, highly valued in the culinary world, as well as the morel mushroom. Doesn't fetch quite the price as a morel, but it has very, very incredible texture and flavor. Some people say that it has a fruity, apricot-like flavor, uh, which if you can find that, those patches, typically those are um, perennial patches, so what this patch of chanterelles isn't going to taste like the next patch over. And so if you find a good patch of chanterelles that have great flavor, that's because that the mycelium bed in that specific spot is just that much better. And it's kind of like um, if you were to grow, um, I know a trend was people sprouting avocado seeds, right? And if, you were, if that person would be so disappointed when they planted that avocado in the ground, because what the fruit that comes off that avocado tree is not going to taste like the fruit that came you know, that they got the seed out of because each tree in an avocado, they all taste different. And so the ones that they're selecting for the grocery store, you know, people have gone and found, okay, this is the best tasting one, so we're gonna grow this genetic. Same with chanterelle, uh, with the mycelium. And as you can see, they can grow quite large. They're always gonna be roughly like this, orange on top and the bottom side will also be an orange like a white lightish orangey color there will not be true what they call a true gill and so you're not going to see um, gills that protrude off the surface the really textured gills you know when you think of mushroom you're not going to see those gills on this mushroom this one has what they call the current um, the current gills and so it's little ridges that run from the stipe up underneath the cap of the mushroom, and that's where they're going to spore from. But that's an identification feature for a chanterelle that you need to know. If you pick up an orange mushroom and look at the bottom of it and it has obvious gills, it's not chanterelle. It's probably jack-o'-lantern, which is toxic. So you've got to be very careful with this kind of stuff. Um, but look how beautiful. This is a good gill shot. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. The, the gills start on the stipe here and then run all the way through in a very, there's no real pattern to it, you know, it's swirly, it's very pretty, whereas 
your typical mushroom, if you flip it over, you're going to see obvious gills that come out in a straight line from the bottom of the stipe. So this one's healthy. This is a yeah, very healthy mushroom. Um, and of course, proper foraging. You don't have to do this, but when I, they make mush, mushroom foraging knives, which I love. They have a little brush on the end of them. And so you pick the mushroom. There's a big, big debate on whether you pick the mushroom or should you cut it from the ground. I think that you just find picking the mushroom because the real mushroom is underground. If you remember me talking about that. Um, but yeah, you would pick this, brush it off with your with your knife, stick it in your basket, take it home, and cook it pretty quickly within you know two or three days. These really start to come out when the temps get pretty warm, so 70s, 80s, 90s, with when we're having good rains. So think June, July, August, into September. If we're having good rains, this mushroom is abundant. This year wasn't the best year for it um, because we did have some droughts in the middle of the summer. However, if you do, you can find local or small spots, you know, that are highly shaded or that are in ravines that are gonna, gonna stay kind of moist. That would be a good spot to look for a chanterelle. And of course, you're gonna be looking under hardwood trees. Are you finding any right now? I haven't been out recently, um, but it was, right now would be a great time to go look because of all the rain. But these, um, like I said, start to pop up June, July, August, September, and this is maybe number two on the list of mushrooms people are really, really looking for um, as far as flavor profile goes and texture. Of course, lion's mane is another one. This is one of the morel lookalikes, um, and if you, if you look and tell, I mean, the cap, I really don't know why they call it a lookalike, but they, you know, they have to do that with mushrooms so you're not just going around and, oh, that looks like a morel and pop it in your mouth. You see the cap on this mushroom? It's wrinkly. There's no honeycomb, is what they call. So a morel is going to have a honeycomb cap like this. It will look almost like that, you know, the honeycomb cap, but up on this portion. This is an elfin saddle. And this mushroom can be eaten if you cook the mess out of it. Um, and I'm not one of those types, I don't like to play around with uh, like poke weed. I don't want to have to double boil it to eat it. I don't want to have to boil something and get rid of the water. I, you know, I'll go to the supermarket before I do that. Um, but this is one of those mushrooms that I think in Sweden, they eat a lot of this mushroom, but they know how to properly prepare it. It's a really attractive mushroom to me. Really funky looking. Okay, the next species we're going to go over, these are oyster mushrooms, and which is another highly, highly common mushroom in Mississippi. They love to grow, I find them a lot of times on willow trees for whatever reason, um, any willow. They, an older willow tree, especially a big thicket, um, you go in, once it starts to cool off on into November, December even, if we're not in the freezing temperatures and it has just rained, I can almost guarantee you will find oyster mushrooms if you're walking down the trail, you know, the bike trail. They are everywhere. On your left, you'll see them. On the right, there's oyster mushrooms everywhere. And they're edible. They're, some people, you know, this is some people, this is one of my least favorite edible mushrooms. Um, some people love it. To me, it has almost a fishy, fishy smell to it, and which I, is all putting for me when I'm eating something that's not a fish. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful mushroom. This is the same patch of mushroom. Just a few days later, no, I'm wrong there. The same patch just a few days later, and so they really explode with growth. You want to catch them before this phase. So this phase is when they kind of start to get a little smelly. Perfectly fine to eat, but if you get them, if you get them at that phase or that phase, that's when I will eat. If they're shaped like that, they don't. They typically have a much milder flavor to them. Um, the texture is much better. They're, they're not slimy. They have an actual kind of a something you can bite into. You know. So they prefer the dead dying. Yes. More they, so than they'll like, grow on oh, a li lively looking yeah, tree. They'll right? grow on a living tree, but not nearly as often as a dead or dead or dying tree. And so willows, um, which is another good reason to hunt. Uh, look for these around willow trees. Willow trees are very brittle. 
And so whenever we have a big storm, um, it's very easy for a willow tree to drop a branch or for a branch to break off. Um, and that's where they're gonna come out of. So that broken off branch, the, the oyster mushroom, they get triggered by the oxygen that, that pours in through the wound and that oxygen tells them to freeze. Um, to, so if you have a spot um, that you know a tornado has been through or you know bulldozers have gone through, it's a good idea to come back in the winter and look for this mushroom. They love damaged, damaged trees. This is another type of oyster mushroom. This is the Pleurotus ostriatus. And so this one, you can see, is a little bit different in color. It's a brown color. And it looks to be growing out of grass, which oyster mushrooms grow on wood only, right? And so when you see something like this, it's growing on an old dead stump or a root underground. And so a lot of people would be like, well, I'm not going to eat that mushroom because it's not on wood and it might not be an oyster. If I were to dig into the ground right there, you would probably find a root or an old stump where a tree had been cut. But look at the underside of this mushroom. Beautiful, beautiful gills. Uh, I'm really attracted to the gill patterns on mushrooms, obviously. Um, the swirls, I mean, you can just get lost in there. But this is, these type of mushrooms harbor bugs a lot easier. You know, they have more folds and ripples. So bugs will get in there. And one way to clean your mushrooms of bugs is just get a bucket of water and drop them in there with maybe a little salt and the bugs will start to drop out. You can also get your mushroom knife and kind of brush at the gills. But I know through experience that this mushroom's gills are very brittle and so I'm, we're gonna be breaking the mushroom trying to, trying to clean it. These are some oyster mushrooms that I grew. Uh, pink oyster mushrooms, I have them upside down. Let's see. Just a beautiful, beautiful stack of mushrooms that I grew. Next, we're going to talk about chicken of the woods, uh, which is another one that people love this mushroom. And it's, I, I enjoy it too if you prepare it right and if you get the right portion of the mushroom. A lot of people think that uh, you can eat this whole mushroom, and you can eat it, you know, the, the entirety of the mushroom. But this portion of the mushroom, very tough. Um, and I, you know, it's almost like a woody texture. You have to cook the mess out of it to get it to soften up. So when I harvest chicken of the woods, I cut these lobes right here. They're really soft, tender, fresh, new growth. Um, and they're already in a perfect size, really, to batter up and throw into some oil and fry them up. And people, people will season this mushroom in a similar way that you would season fried chicken because the texture of this mushroom is very, um, has a muscly, muscly texture. So when you pull this mushroom apart, you can see the individual fibers of it, much like you would see on a muscle. And so when you bite it, it gives that same feel and texture to say a vegan who's not eating chicken. This would be a good substitute for them because they can make it taste like chicken. This mushroom starts to fruit. This one's weird in Mississippi because of our climate. It will fruit really whenever. But once the temperatures start to warm up, May, June, July, August, September, I found them into October. Uh, but it's a warm season mushroom and they'll start to come up. Very easy to identify. This is the only mushroom that looks like this in Mississippi, pretty much. So if you, if you come across this, you wanna make sure that it doesn't have gills. It's gonna have pores, meaning tiny, tiny microscopic holes and the underside needs to be yellow or white. There's two different species that grows around here. You have sulfurius and then cincinnatus. This is cincinnatus, and this one would have a white pore structure underneath. And it's my favorite over sulfurius. The sulfurous has a sulfury smell to me and a sulfury taste. I, I just don't like it as much. Is that a oak tree? Yes, big oak tree. And they're gonna grow off where I find them a lot is in people's front yards. They have a big oak tree and they've been mowing around the roots. And the mower will hit those roots and it leaves a perfect room for this mushroom. And I, there are some yards, um, past Pump and Center, that their whole front yard is this mushroom. I, I, I want to go knock on their door and I'm like, hey, do you know what this is? I'm sure they don't, but it's wild. I've, you've never seen anything like it. And it's because they've been mowing over their tree roots and allowing the mushroom to, and this mushroom will take the tree, for sure. Um, it will kill it. 
They know not what they do. Somebody told me that it's easier to find that one in the hills. Is that true? Um, yeah, you're not going to really find any wooded, heavily wooded area would be a good spot to search. Um, hills are hard to hunt because, you know, you're doing this constantly. But this one will really grow just about anywhere that there's good hardwood. Now, morels, you're going to search the hills. That's why morel hunting can kind of get a little strenuous because, you know, I've, I've gone out and done like 22,000 steps and half of those were stairs because I was going up and down hills. You know, it can get pretty strenuous. This is a chicken of the woods mushroom well past its prime. And so if you saw a chicken of the woods like this, you would not want to eat it. Um, it would be, it might be a little rancid and then it would be much harder in texture. You couldn't really get this to taste good. But I like to show people this because what I do when I see this is I pull the mushroom off the tree and I'll set it somewhere else around the base of the tree and next year, a new one will come up and I'll get there early. Uh, you, these are perennial mushrooms, so if you find them and, and you harvest it, you know the next year you can come back and it will be there if the conditions are right. Ten more, okay, I'm gonna fly through these last ones. This is reishi mushroom. Uh, this one is highly touted in China for its medicinal properties. People will grind this up and make tea with it. And it's supposed to be very good for, um, it's supposed to help with like nerve degeneration in the mind. It's supposed to help with memory. Um, it's supposed to help with energy. They have a whole list of things that this mushroom, that they benefit from by, by eating it. There's different, different kinds. I think this is one of the prettiest mushrooms we have in Mississippi. Um, just the, the ombre effect from white to that dark red is beautiful. This mushroom is, is, is hard as wood, so this isn't one that you eat, you would grind it and boil it into a tea. How, do you, how long before you before you would put it in your tea? Like, would you wait like three days, 10 days? No, I think you'd steep it pretty quick, kind of like any sweet tea or something like that. Is there any, uh, do you ever ferment mushrooms? Is that ever done? They will ferment the fungus, but not the actual fruiting body. Okay. If, if you follow me there. Like, uh, Koji, or that special rice that they make in Asia. Uh -huh. That's a mushroom that they put onto the rice to grow on it, which then changes the flavor profile of the rice. And that's one of their delicacies over there. Another, one of my favorites that I wanted to talk about is lion's mane. And you can see how it gets the name lion's mane. It has these long tooth-like structures. This is a small one. Um, they can get quite large. This is a very young lion's mane. This one grows on Highland Street, if you want to drop by and look, uh, kind of close to December. Uh, and you can see very young lion's mane have this brain-like appearance, and it's pink. If you, can, if you were up here and look, you can almost see a pinkish hue. And so in Asia, this is brain food. They have a belief that if the food resembles a part of the body, then it has to benefit that part of the body when you eat it. And so this mushroom is used for cognitive function People eat this for energy, they eat it for tumor, it has tumor suppressing properties. And this one, it has some scientifically based facts behind it. So they're actually on to something with this one, um, that they're finding compounds called beta-glucans, um, which is a new compound that really are only found in fungus and bacteria, but it's a new medicinal compound that we're pulling out of mushrooms. Um, and they've known about this in Asia for 10,000 years. They eat mushrooms pretty much in every meal to, to get these beta-glucans. And what the beta-glucans do, they're anti-tumor, they're uh, anti-cancer, they're just anti-inflammatory. It's just something you obviously, you know, if that's what it's doing, you would want it, right? Great mushroom, it has an awesome texture. People you make like fake crab cakes with this and they are delicious. You slice it just like a crab cake and then you, you know, Old Bay, whatever you would put on your crab cakes, you know, and fry it up just the same, and it's crazy how close to a crab cake you can get this to taste. People around me are saying they use lion manes to lower their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It does that as well. There's a, that's, you need to really kind of Google because it, the list goes on and on and on of all the medical, medical properties these mushrooms have potentially. Uh, old Man of the Woods, one of my, this is a really cool looking mushroom. Uh, it almost looks like meringue, the top of the, the cap. Um, and this one is edible. The underside, it's a bold mushroom. The underside is black. 
Um, and this one has a nutty flavor to it. Um, some people like it, some people don't. And it's going to grow in the summer as well. This is a pheasant back mushroom. As you can see how it gets the name. It kind of has like a feathery, pheasanty appearance to it. This is another edible mushroom. And these, I think nine out of ten of these slides have been pictures of me just walking down the bike trail. So if you want to find mushrooms, just get on your bike. Don't stay on, well, stay on the trail, but hide your bike somewhere and walk through the woods and kind of walk around. Uh, but this mushroom, pheasant back, you're going to want to catch it early as well, maybe about that big. That's when they're at eating size. At this point, it's pretty woody. But What's the name of that one again? Pheasant back. Pheasant back. Of it. Here we have a Coprinus pomatus, which is a shaggy mane or ink cap mushroom. And this one is really, really cool. If you have young kids and you find this mushroom, what I like to tell people to do is put them in a bowl, and in a few hours, the whole mushroom melts down into this black ink, and then you can draw with the ink, and the ink actually is a permanent, it will stay for 100 years. You know? uh, but it's really, really cool. Some people say this is the best tasting mushroom they've ever eaten, but because of the properties of that it, it pretty much kills itself um, once it's been picked, uh, because of those properties, you have to get this home and eat it within about two hours. So you don't have very long, so chefs will pay high dollar for this mushroom if you can grow it, pick it, and get it to them you know, within those two hours. Can you is, say the name of that one one more time, I'm sorry. Coprinus pomatus. It's okay. shaggy mane. Okay. Shaggy mane. This is horse mushroom, so if you have a horse pasture or really any green pasture, any good field, this is a agaricus mushroom. And so it's gonna almost have an almond, not even not almost, it smells like almond extract, and that's how you know that you have found this horse mushroom. The gills will be pink. And I never suggest anybody to eat a white mushroom. Uh, stay away from white mushrooms and brown mushrooms because those two mushrooms have the most toxic lookalikes around here. Uh, this one, however, is edible. It has a pink gill, and I know, um, especially through the smell, and it's actually a tasty mushroom. This is the white button mushroom that you buy at the supermarket. This is, that's what this is. Um, however, the deadliest mushroom in Mississippi resembles this almost to a T. And so if you don't know that the the Amanita Bosporagera, if you don't know that its gills are a white, then you know, you might, or sorry, if you walk up to that Amanita Bosporagera thinking it's this, and you don't know that this mushroom has pink gills, and you eat that mushroom, what this mushroom will do to you is there's really nothing to stop it. The toxins, medical, science hasn't figured it out yet. What happens is you eat the mushroom and you feel fine for three days, but during those three days, it's destroying your liver. And so people don't know that they're sick until that three day point. And then when they go to the doctor, it's too late. And so the only way to really reverse this poisoning would be to know immediately that you messed up and go to the doctor. Because they can stop it then. But if it's in your system for three or four days, there's really nothing they can do and it will kill you. And those are pretty common in our area under pine trees in drier areas. So that's why I say, just, and I don't even, I'm not eating a white mushroom, I'm not eating a brown mushroom, because the second deadliest mushroom in Mississippi is brown, deadly gallerina, and it looks exactly like Flamulina volutopes, which is a highly sought after edible mushroom. And so I just tell people to kind of steer clear of all that, of those. Look at this. This is why I love mushrooms, the different forms, the different textures, the colors. This one is, um, Amanita jacksonii. Um, in the south, that's what we call it. In Europe, they have the same mushroom. It's just a little bit different, and it's called Amanita caesarea. And it's named after Julius Caesar, because this was his favorite mushroom to eat. He was known to jump, hop off of his horse when he would see him, or you know, have somebody bring him to him, and he would eat these immediately when he found them, because they're high in protein. And you can imagine you're on a long jaunt. You know, it, this would be something that would be highly sought after. And, you know, He's the one that got them. I call this one lipstick mushroom because it looks like uh, a lipstick. If you catch it before this phase, it looks like an egg. Um, so it'll be a white egg looking structure. And then you can see the cap will bust out and leave this white patch. Well, 
lot of times stay on top of the mushroom. This is not the Mario mushroom. This one's edible 100%. You don't have to cook this in any special way. This one's edible. The Mario mushroom has to be prepared in a certain way if you want to not get sick. Last mushroom I want to talk about, this one is a, a medicinal mushroom named turkey tail. So this one is being used for in medicine for anti-cancer, anti-tumor, all of those things that those beta glucans would provide. Um, that's about where I'm going to wrap it up. Um, if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to answer. Do you sell the mushrooms you grow? I, when I have the time, yes. Recently, it's been probably a year since I've grown anything. My last grow, I did a bunch of shiitakes, and I did sell those. Shiitake you, is my favorite mushroom. When you grow the mushrooms, do you have to have a, a special environment? Yes. It's not, um, so if you do outdoor grows, no, you don't. Um, so if you were to, I'll just start from the beginning. If you wanted to grow a shiitake, outside you can do this at your own home you would look for an oak tree preferably white oak red oak will work also um, and you're going to be looking for a tree about eight inches in diameter and it has to be a fresh tree it can't be a tree that fell in, on your land and it's been sitting there for five years um, because that tree is already fully inoculated with fungus and so the whole point of you um, cutting a fresh tree to inoculate is because you want your fungus to outcompete everything else and so you would cut your white oak tree or red oak late winter before sap is running. So late winter, early spring before the sap's running. And the sap really just slows down the spread of the mycelium. Trees use the sap as an antifungal um, property and it's how they move nutrients up and down. And so you want to catch that tree at the perfect moisture level, which is late winter when it hasn't started running sap. And so you'll cut your tree, section it into logs, really however long you want, but you need to be able to handle them and move them around. So I typically go four feet. Um, and you drill holes down the hardwood, down the log, about four inches apart, and then you would hammer in with, you buy mycelium online, um, starting out. You know, this you can grow it your, yourself, I do it. Um, but starting out, I would go online, and there's thousands of websites to go to look at, but you order your mushroom dowels, is what they call it, or plug spawn, and you simply hammer in to the holes that you drilled in the log. You want a hole every four inches, all the way around the log, kind of in a diamond pattern, you know, alternating where the holes are at, you know, giving you the most coverage. You hammer in the spawn, you cover it with, I wish I had, I had all these pictures and I lost the, they didn't make it onto this slide, but you hammer them all in and then you cover them with wax and then you let that log sit. Um, normally it takes about eight months. At that time you can, you know, the mushroom log is ready to fruit. Uh, shiitake, the reason I love shiitake so much is because you can force it to fruit, meaning if I know my log is totally inoculated with the fungus with shiitake, I can get the log and I, you take a bat or something kind of stiff and hard and you kind of lightly bang against the side of this log and that's tricking the mushroom into thinking that the tree has fallen over. And so when you hit the bark, it puts micro fissures in the bark where more oxygen gets to enter the log. That's where the mushrooms are going to come out at. And so not only that, but yeah, you hit them, you hit them with the, not really hard, you know, just to kind of bang on them a little, dent them up a little bit. And then what I do is I soak them in water for half a day, maybe even 24 hours. And what that's doing, and you can believe this or not, but it's true. What that does is it simulates monsoon season. So in Asia, where these mushrooms grow naturally, they flush in huge numbers during monsoon season and they're gone. Um, and so you can trick this mushroom into fruiting once a month, once every two months, by hitting it with a, hitting it with a bat or a stick and then soaking it in water. And it, it tricks it like it's going through monsoon season. And within a week of doing that, mushrooms will start to grow out of the shiitake or out of the log. So is there a temperature range they kind of like? Or yeah, if, if you're gonna, they're naturally. rather. If you're, if, they're, if you're gonna let them naturally fruit, meaning you're not gonna go through the process of hitting them and soaking them, you're gonna get a flush in the spring, um, and then you'll get a flush in the fall. A flush, you know, I've done 10 logs and gotten 50 pounds, like tons and tons of mushrooms whenever you have a good fruit. 
you know, if it's a drier period, you can spray it down with water hose, kind of keep maybe a light tarp over it or something like that to keep some moisture in. Um, that's how I like to do it in Mississippi, the log. Now, to your question, if you move that indoors, it's a totally different ball game. It's so much harder to keep it, um, keep the, the medium clean. Um, nature does a lot of the, believe it or not, nature does a lot of the cleaning itself. You know, there's organisms that eat other organisms and yada, yada, yada that aren't in your house. And so when you bring that item in your house, one mold spore can come and land on. So when you're growing indoors, it's what you grow on petri dishes. You cut the mycelium out and then you add it to like millet a grain and then you add the grain to sawdust. So it's a pretty, pretty big process. And every step of that process, it has to be totally sanitary. If any fungal spore, any mushroom spore lands on your grain, it will outcompete the shiitake. Shiitake is a slow-growing mushroom, and so what you'll find is green patches in your in your mycelium as trichoderma. Trichoderma eats mushrooms, and you you won't have any mushrooms. But yeah, much harder to grow. Mycelium. One more question back here. Did you notice because we had such a dry summer this year that there were some mushrooms that just didn't grow? Yeah, chanterelles. Chanterelles is what I have. Chanterelles were very poor this year. The only chance I had of finding them was highly local. Like I knew this spot was close to a creek or highly shaded, you know, stuff like that. And then um, a lot of early morning when there's some dew on the ground can kind of help a little bit, but it was a bad, bad summer. However, it was a banner year for morel. So it's just kind of when we get to rainfall. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you all.